Vince is rapid fire for the better. Uh, every single time. Every <laughs> I had a little bit of rapid fire withdrawal last night because we didn't have it. I kind of did too, to be honest. And you know, like I said, because of the unique circumstance of the way the show came together yesterday, right? we punted our own. We 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 punted <sighs> down the field on on rapid fire. It was a little different not having a rapid fire. It really was. It was night. like, oh, I, I guess admit the that show's over. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so let's go back. All right. To Micah Shrewsbury, introduced as head coach today, men's basketball coach at Notre Dame. And here, if I can get back to my screen, here is Micah Shrewsbury. Why did you come here? Uh, what drew you back? And home is a big part of it. All right, I, I get a chance to see my family now um, really closely and get a chance to be with them um, on a short drive away. Uh, but the other thing is, and I truly believe this, you can win a national championship here. You can win a national championship here, and that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to fight for every single day. We're also going to do it the right way. We're going to find kids that fit Notre Dame. We're going to find kids that care about their academics. We're going to find kids that want to be great basketball players, and there's a chance for you to do both here. And if we do that, we find those kids, we'd be the toughest team, we'd be the most disciplined team, we'd be the most together team. We're going to pursue national championships. All right, Vince. So, uh, like, that is the boldest of statements that Micah Shrewsbury, I think, made today at his introductory press conference. We're going to pursue national championships. You can win a national championship at Notre Dame. Do you buy or sell it? I sell him talking about it today or yesterday, <laughs> today, it was today. I sell it because. Yeah, still today. It was this morning. Yeah, I was today. like, Wait, when, what day was that? Yeah, <laughs> it was today. Yeah. I sell it uh, because, look, I'm, I'm, he said a lot of great things in the press conference. I thought he was very engaging. I thought, you know, the defense first and we're going to play as a team. We're going to da 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 da. Awesome. Great. You didn't have to take that next step. You know what the next step would have been? We're going to win games, man, or <laughs> we're, we're fighting for conference titles, you know, like national championship, man. Like there's one final four appearance and it was before I was born. So True. let's slow the roll here a little bit on national championships. Like I love that that's his goal, but that's where I kind of lost him a little bit when he's talking about his goals and expectations for being at Notre Dame. Like, Interesting. I did. I was like, come on. No, come on, man. Like, be realistic. I was come on. I, I was very I was very impressed that he got as bold as he did. Like he came out gunning threes. Yes, he did. Right off the top. You know, yes, like he did. we're we're here. We can win national championships at Notre Dame. It, look, it's an expectation. Okay, you're holding your program to a high expectation. Just like you said, is it gonna happen overnight? Absolutely not. Like it's not gonna happen this year. But all we have to do is look at the makeup of this year's Final Four and say anything can happen <laughs> in college basketball, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, no, like absolutely. If, if 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 this year tells us nothing else, here's here's the you know like the reality of competing for national championships as a private school. Like in the last sixty years, eleven national championships have been won by private schools. Five of them by Duke, three of them by Villanova. Georgetown has another. Marquette in 1977 had another. The other in 1963, you have to go all the way back to 1963, Loyola of Chicago. Like wow. those, those are the only schools, 11 of them, in the last 60 years. And again, five of them are by Duke, three of them are by Villanova. So the majority are right mm -hmm. there in the last, what, 30... 38 years, something like that. So the reality is it is harder, much harder for private schools yeah. to be in that mix. But like if you go to just a couple of years ago, if Loyola Chicago can get to the final four, there's no reason Notre Dame shouldn't be able to get to the final four. Sure. In, I, in my book. No problem with that. Great. But I and just if you get to he, the final four, anything can happen. Yeah, He jumped right. over a bunch of steps. He's very, very bold. Again, very bold yeah. right out of the gate. You know, yeah. like 
you're right. Let's let's see the program built back up first because there is a lot of foundation building that needs to be laid in this whole thing before you start right and seriously talking about national championships. Correct. It's, it's good that that's out there, but there's a lot of work to be done to get even to the point where you can start talking about NCAA tournament, let alone right. actually winning a national championship. There was a press conference in 2004 uh, in the same building where a promise was made for a decided schematic advantage as well. <laughs> okay. Like the, you can say whatever you want in a press conference. I just like to keep things a little bit more realistic. Should Notre Dame, should he be shooting, like behind closed doors, should he be shooting for a national championship? Great. Yes, absolutely. No problem with that. And people can be like, oh, aim high. Anything's possible with the transfer portal. Not at Notre Dame. Have you guys been paying attention? <laughs> they, they can't just go out and get anybody they want from the transfer portal. So, yes. See, that's Come on. Like, real realism, people. Like, See, that's, that's what like I need here. Like Michael is saying, if FAU can do it, Notre Dame should be able to. Well, the difference, though, Michael, is FAU is a public school. Notre Dame Correct. is a private school. And we all know the difference, the limitations that you have at Notre Dame. You know, how 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 much is the transfer portal going to be a factor? You know, that's that's the biggest issue that I that I think that he faced. You know, and I know he was asked about NIL and transfer portal today. Transfer portal is the biggest thing to sure. me. Because with all these players moving around, switching teams every year, there's a much greater chance that Notre Dame, as a private, you know, higher education school, is going to lose guys as opposed to gaining more guys from the transfer portal. Absolutely. You know, that's 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 the reality of the deal. And that's how you get get better quickly, just like the Kansas State example that I've used before. You've got to be able – to, to use that transfer portal to your advantage. And, you know, they've already lost two guys to the portal yep. right now. Well, good know, guys so. too. So, you know, yeah. he's he's got his work cut out for him. I, I love that he's aiming high. That's awesome. That's great, you know. But I would be happy with, hey, you know what we're going to do next year? We're going to be over 500. <laughs> like, now, and I you don't say that stuff well, in a press conference, and I get that. But – there's definitely ways he could have gone about it without saying national championships but, like five different times. As Michael said, recruits heard his speech. We'll hear it later. I mean, that's sure. That's, that's fair. fine. You're that's out there fine. talking to recruits and you're telling them this is our goal. And here. he's a good recruiter. And that's yeah. great. You know, that he, he's a good recruiter. He knows more about recruiting than I ever will. So if that's what he thinks is going to get guys to come to Notre Dame, awesome. Good awesome. recruiter. And like Bray, it seems like he's a pretty good developer. As well, you know, like look at look at what they did at Butler when he was on that Butler staff. Sure, with with Brad Stevens, it, it's not like everyone that they were going out and getting was a five star guy. You know, they were they were they, they got specific guys and they developed them. So let's see what I'm, I'm at least excited to see first how he's able to to put together a roster this year and then see yeah. what that becomes over the next four years because I got a feeling going to be a pretty young roster that he's going to have this mm -hmm. year they might take some lumps early on sure will it pay dividends two three four years down the road that'll absolutely be, and that was one of the funny things that he said in his press conference he's like i was talking to jack and uh you know uh father jenkins and uh they expect me to be able to field the team like that's our first goal is we need to field the team and i was like all right now we're talking field the <laughs> team there's your goal field you go. a team that's exactly like he brought right. his expectations way down really fast. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny. All right, some more from defensive coordinator Al Golden. He talked about a couple specific players we're going to talk about now, starting with Jordan Botello. Knock on the door. The way you knock on the door is, is play the system, play with poise, and execute. That is it. That's it. Because he'll always bring the energy. He'll always bring the fight. He'll always bring the finish. So that's not the issue. The issue is prepare, eliminate Emmys, um, play with poise, and execute within the realm of the defense. And if you do that, he's going to do really great things for us. Does he understand that now? Well, I mean, that's a question for him. But um, that that every, every one of our players is different. So you asked me about him. That's his challenge. So <coughs> um, it's going to play out this spring, whether or not he understands that. And... And if we had like another hour and lunch, 
I could go to the next guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right? And then, then if you wanted to get a beer, I can go to yeah. the next guy. <laughs> I'd like to do that. But, we're, but you know what I mean? Like, <coughs> I just gave you his, but every kid's got certain roles yeah. that they have to fill this, this spring. And if you want a promotion, you have to execute your current role. It's pretty simple. By the way, he, he said eliminate Emmys. I'm assuming that means mental errors. Yes, M-E. that's what I would like. Do. Is yeah. that, yeah. Um, yeah. So what do you think? What do you think? Listening to, to Al Golden talking about Jordan Batello there, Vince. I think it is the same thing that we've heard about Jordan Batello since he stepped foot on campus. All the talent in the world on the field, but he's used the word preparation when he talks about things he needs to make sure Regardless right. of who the coach is, by the way. Yes, correct. And the word preparation is kind of a uh, – uh, it's a word that means needs to get his crap together off the field so that he can be <laughs> successful on the field. All right? Sure. I mean, that's what preparation means. So And play within the system. And like play within actually, the system. Yes, exactly. Like there, are, there are kids who are like athletic – specimens i know you've worked with with some of them before especially in you know public schools where it's like it's one thing to be a great athlete but you still have to carry out a specific assignment and if you're just going rogue on every play you're not helping anybody and you're all you're going to do is stand on the sideline you still have to yeah you have to know what you're supposed to do on any given play and then use that talent that you have to execute that specific assignment to the to the fullest degree right and he's never he he will never you know question his want or his motor or his athletic ability that's never been a question with jordan Matelho. it has always been can you play within the system and can you make yourself available to be able to play within the system right and that's still the biggest question mark with him and it, it seemed like he did a better job of that last year. In I agree. the instances we actually yes. got to see him on the field. Now, it was still relatively limited. He was on a lot of special teams. Sure. And I don't think we saw him make any special teams blunders. You know, we saw him, you know, block one of the punts and, and stuff like that. So, you know, at, at least in those cases, he was carrying out his assignments. Yeah. That, yeah. That's But that's that's the biggest question with him is, is can you be a dependable guy that your teammates and your coaches can count on play in and play out? Because I mean, the guy could be, the guy's got enough talent to be an all American and a, a high NFL draft. Yes. Pick if, if he puts it together. Absolutely. Yep. Could not agree more. Got all the talent in the world, but you gotta, you gotta know your role and you gotta know your lane and you gotta stay That's in right. Million dollar arm, 10 cent brain. I'm not, you know, it's a, I'm just right. using the, the right. Bull Durham cliche. I'm not saying he has a ten cent, but that was the Bull Durham quote. But the point is, you got to have both. You can't have yeah. one or the other. Exactly. Yeah. Going back to what we were talking about a second ago, Johnny says you guys have to listen to what he, being Shrewsbury, said. He said he believes that a national championship could be won here. He did not say that he was going for it out of the gate, and that's not what we were saying. That's I mean, not what we were, we're saying. No, we're. <laughs> But we're just saying that based on where the program is right now, even saying national championship is a pretty lofty preposition. Very much so. Like I said, look at the history of Notre Dame basketball. 1978 was the last time they were at a Final Four. It was a long time ago. That was before I was born. And you mentioned all of the Catholic institutions, right? Or the, the private school institutions that have won national championships and over they're the last actually 60 all, years. Well, Duke isn't Catholic, I guess. But, yeah, but I mean, you're talking private. about 50 out of the 60 have not been private. Correct. Right? And so, you know, that's a, that's, you're, you are, you are treading upstream. Okay. You're going upstream. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. Now. If he can do that, if he can take Notre Dame, look, if you're going to win a national championship, you're probably going to go to multiple Final Fours, okay? If he can do that, wow. I mean, that is awesome. I will be his, one of his biggest cheerleaders. I will be super excited about that as a Notre Dame fan and as somebody that gets to cover the team. But that is some lofty stuff to be bringing up in your press conference when you have five scholarship players on your roster right now. Four, yeah. technically. Right. By the way, did you did you see all the coaches in there like Marcus Freeman, yeah, Neil Ivy, and I think I saw Sean Stifler, the baseball coach, in there. That was they were awesome. All, like hanging out, yeah, that was he awesome. Was, he mentioned them. He mentioned Freeman and and Neil multiple times mm-hmm. during that whole thing. I thought that was pretty cool. 
Yeah, I mean, and I this is the first really over the last couple of years. This is the first time that there's been kind of this coaching, you know, fraternity at Notre Dame where they're actually supporting each other and you know doing all these things. I love it. I think that's I think that's awesome, and I, I do like to see it. Does that make things better? I don't know, but I know for a fact that there was friction amongst coaches in the past, more often than not. And there absolutely was. That, yeah. That's not the case right now, at least from what we can tell. And I'll be curious to see like how long all the good vibes do last, because I can tell you in the past that there weren't necessarily bad vibes early on, but Fair enough. once you kind of start feeling like, you know, you're the stepchild a little yeah. bit. I mean, you are the men's basketball coach at a football school. He was coming out of a football school, yeah. but he was only there for a couple of years. You know, like how long is how long is that? And he mentioned last? it. I mean, he did bring that up. So, I mean, it's not mm-hmm. it is not a foreign concept to him. Right. I mean, he's like, I love that this is a football school. You know, I'm excited to cheer on the team and, da, 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 da. and like, OK, he gets it. Let's see if he let's see if the reality is the same. Be, yes. Yeah, let's see if the reality meets what he thinks it's going to be. Right. All right, so more Al Golden. Final thought from him on linebacker Prince Colley. PK, and um, got to get him healthy. You know, we, we get him healthy and get him to have a consistent run at things. He's going to be really good. So I love the kid, love the player. He works hard. Um, he's low maintenance. Um, no, I mean, I think uh, – I think – you know, he's in the mix. He was in the mix last year, and he's right there. So um, I just expect, you know, a great challenge by, you know, the PKs, the Zigs, the Sneeds, all those guys challenging, you know, those older three guys for reps. And, and um, you know, hopefully uh, over time, that's just going to make us stronger. So when you listen to that, Vince, scale of 1 to 10, how much does it encourage you on the prospects for Prince Cully? Oh, it's very much encouraging because he keeps saying that he's right there and he's in the mix and, you know, all of these things. And I think that if you're in the mix and you're right there, then you need playing time. Like that's, you know, what is that going to look like? I think is the bigger question. I think, you know, he talked about Sneed, Prince Collie and Ziggler, right? That's what, that's what he, he he's using nicknames or whatever. But, you know, if those three guys are all right there, then they all need to be on the field at some point, whether they're starting or not. I don't care. Like in football, even more so these days, whether you're a starter, whether you rotate in, especially defensively, I mean, I realize that's an ego thing, but like it doesn't matter to me. At the end of the day, how many snaps did you get in the game? That's what that's more important, you know, and were you in there when it mattered? I think those three guys need to get opportunities on the field. They need to get those opportunities in big time situations. Now, the three guys you're saying, Kali, Sneed. Ziegler? Ziegler is that the one yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, well, that's what he mentioned. He he mentioned three of those three guys. So okay, yeah, those are the three guys I'm going to mention. And, yeah, and they they seem to be the ones who are you know knocking at the door, whatever you want to call it, right now. But you know, I agree with what you're saying. You might only get a couple of reps, but if you make the most of those couple of reps that you have, and then you keep stacking together, mm-hmm. you know those those kind of reps, and you know like. Sooner or later, it's going to lead to more for you. Yeah. And that's that's really all it takes. So I am pretty encouraged. I'd give it an eight, I think, you know, just, just yeah. based on listening to that. That's right. It, I, didn't, it, I, didn't the, I, I don't think these guys are as overlooked as a lot of people think. I, I think that, you know, these coaches get to see them day in and day out. They know the kind of talent that they have. But, right. But they can't see guys, you know, just like what we were talking about with Jordan Botello. You can't have guys who are going to blow assignments and then turn right. – what's maybe, you know, a loss or a five yard gain into a 50 yard gain or a touchdown, Correct. you know, that's, Correct. that's what happens on defense. If you have guys who can't carry out their assignments and that's, that's what they've got to see. They've just got to have, yeah. they've got to see consistency in carrying those things out. Yep. I, I love Prince Collie. I, I think he could be really, really good. I mean, his athleticism is off the charts. Same, same with Snead. I mean, those two kids need to be on the field. I mean, they just absolutely do. Like I've been excited about this group for a while. And my my excitement is not tempered, so I'd be in the eight eight and a half range as well. Uh, very excited, but the big I mean, we can be as excited as we want to be. If Al Golden's not going to play them, it doesn't matter. That's the problem, right. and we need to see past that, right? We need yeah. to be able to we need to be able to see that those guys are going to get playing time. I really hope that those guys are like showing out on Saturday. Like that would be the ultimate. <laughs> that would be so much fun if that was the case. 
on special teams? <sighs> Sean, <laughs> why are you raining on my parade like that? It's mean. It's mean spirited. Uh, quick trip back to the basketball again. Michael Park says Butler did it. They got to two national championship games. That's true. They did not win a national championship, if that's what you're referring to. They did not win national no, championships. They were close. They lost very close. Two but final fours, two, national, two yep. national championship games. So, yeah, but they did not win one. And, you know, let's let's be honest. Micah Shrewsbury was part of that and that connection to Brad Stevens and, you know, the Boston Celtics. I mean, that's part of why he is here right now. Because of that connection with those teams, Brad Stevens through the Boston Celtics and back to where he is right now. It's a big part of why Micah Shrewsbury is the head coach at Notre Dame right now. I mean, if he can replicate – you're right. I mean, I mean, now, you know, let's let's be honest. Butler was not playing in the Big East back then. So the path for them to getting to the NCAA tournament, you can say, you know, that, that it was harder because you had to get, you had to win your tournament most likely, you know, to get a bid and all those kind of things. They weren't in a multi-bid mm -hmm. league, which, you know, Notre Dame and the ACC, even though the ACC has been down, theoretically, it's going to, the path should be a little bit tougher to get there. But again, I think I think that being in the tournament, yeah, is is your first step, year yes. in and year out. That's your goal. Absolutely, that's a great first goal. You know, go go get a buy in the conference playoffs. You know what I mean? Like set your set your expectations where they need to be, and <laughs> and and then you you once you hit one, then you raise. Right? That's how you build a program. Right? You know, when when I was coaching at the high school level, it was okay. We want to win more games than we lose. We want to win the city, right? There's like five teams in the city. You want to win the city. Then it's, you want to win your division. You want to win the conference and you want to win sectionals. Like you keep raising the bar just a little bit, but you have to have some small victories. You can't be, you can't. And I realize he's not saying they're going to win a national championship out of the gate. I get that. It's not what I'm saying. I'm being hyperbolic, but I am saying you can't be like, National championship or bust, because then you've got no benchmarks to get there, and that's that's tough. That's a tough way to try to build something. Yeah, going back to uh, the linebacker, Christopher says, just don't understand why it's okay for Maris to constantly be out of position, but we won't play the younger guys because we're scared they'll be out of position. Well, my my guess is between you know, the options, right. You know, like the, the, the best of two evils. I, you know, I don't know if that's how you want to phrase it, but you know, like, like he was carrying him out more consistently than the other guys. And that's what got him there. You right. don't just start swapping out guys because, you know, one, you know, well, he's that much worse than this guy. So let's put him in, you know, I just, I don't know. What do you think? Vince? I completely agree. Like we see him missing assignments. Yep. Sure do. And we get frustrated watching it. And, but what does that tell you about what they're seeing in practice? Because coaches aren't just going to be like, I don't care. That kid is absolutely bawling out at practice. We're going to start this kid instead. Right. They're, they're not going to do that, you know, and they're not going to do it out of spite. They're not going to do it at all because they want to win. And Marist was obviously the best practice player that they had. And that's why he was playing. And so, you know, Let's see if that continues. Let's see if that continues with those guys having another year under their belt. Yep. It's Major League Baseball opening day. Fill in the blank. Opening day is blank, Vince. Opening day is a national holiday, which <laughs> I can't partake in. That's that's what opening day is, right? Did you get to see any of the game, nope. uh, the Cubs game today? Nope, because I don't get marquee network. And so I don't get to watch any Cubs games, which really stinks, frankly. But I, I do know that they won. I saw highlights. After the fact, it looked like a pretty good. I believe they shut out the Brewers. It, it looked like a pretty good day on the north yeah. side. So yeah. you know what? I'll take it. It's a great opening day. Cubs are in first place in the Central. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, opening day is beautiful. It's it's you know like you wouldn't you know again like the weather got a little bit better here in South Bend throughout the day, right. but it was still pretty frigid this morning. You know, but it, it's it's like being able to flip on the TV at two o'clock in the afternoon and seeing all these baseball games on. Can't wait all day. You know, you know, and I've got like the the MLB 
ticket or whatever they call that thing. The the <laughs> I don't even know what they call it. But it's glorious to be able to flip yeah. around, see baseball while I'm working in the afternoon. That's that's what I like is like like this time of year now, as long as there's an afternoon game, I'm working in the afternoon, I'm sitting in there with my laptop and I got a baseball game on in the background. Yep. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Jesse was there today. So uh, uh, we'll, I we'll texted get, him. Did you? Yeah, I did. I told him how jealous I was of him, <laughs> and uh, he proceeded to send me pictures of him at the game. So nice. I was like, yes, good for you. Picked but, you off uh, even more. <laughs> it looked beautiful. It looked like he was having a great time. The Cubby was one. I mean, a lot to cheer about. So you know what? That's awesome. That's awesome. That's right. That's right. So with opening day being here, which season opening anticipation is bigger for you baseball college football college basketball nfl or i don't know something else soccer <laughs> rugby whatever it happens to be so because of my job i would say the anticipation and not only because of my job obviously i'm a fan of notre dame football but we talk about it literally every day of the off season. I mean, right? everything we do is building yes. is either building up to the, to the beginning of the season yes. or the next game. Once and the season starts <laughs> only 13 games, 14, if you're lucky, right? Right. There's only 13 to 14 games all season. You get 13 or 14 baseball games in, in three weeks. Right. So I love opening day for baseball. Like I celebrate, I, I wore my Cubs jersey to school when pitchers and catchers reported. You know what I mean? Like I love baseball, love it. Well, absolutely love it. But the anticipation of football season is just different right now in the seat that I'm sitting in, right? Uh, but man, do I love baseball season. It, it, we, it's those two and then everything else is is a distant whatever, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, like yeah, distant. I would agree. I, I would absolutely agree for, for just the reason that you said, because, you know, like you said, it's like we we're counting down right now <laughs> yeah. to, to Notre Dame and Navy. Basically, you charge through the spring. And then as soon as spring's over, literally the countdown begins mm -hmm. to, you know, that that season, you know, training camp and then season opener and and everything else. That's what it's all about. And, you know, like. If we, you know, again, like if we lived in a little bit warmer area where, 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 you know, like sitting in a t-shirt and shorts and, you know, drinking your cold beverage and whatever was a little bit more accessible at this time of year, maybe that would change. But it, just like you, I obviously love baseball yeah. as well. And I, and I can't wait until the weather is a little bit better. I, I've, I've never, never braved the elements like, like Jesse is doing out there today for, uh, for a season opener. I, I don't know about you. But bundling up for baseball just does not. Yeah. Excite it, it's me. just a long time to sit out there and like, cause there's look, I love baseball because it's very, it's a very intellectual game. Like I really enjoy like sitting there and analyzing. I like to keep score, you know, like that kind of stuff, but it, it, it's a lot of sitting there. You're not moving around very much. And so a cold right. game is rough in baseball. It's very rough. I, I think I went to an opening day, I think, a long, long, long time ago, and it was freezing, and it was not all that much fun. At least the sun was out today. So, like, today is not a day where you'd want to be underneath. You know, you'd want to be out in the sun, True. obviously. You know, I'm sure the excitement of opening day was great. You get a couple of, uh, you know, adult beverages in you. I'm sure that certainly helps the cause to stay warm. But, no, I, I generally didn't like going to games until after school got out frankly. So we're talking like June, July, August, right. like that's exactly, let's, let's go. Let's yeah. go. So the Cubs have plus 145 odds on FanDuel to win at least 80 games this season. Scale of one to 10, how confident are you they will hit that number? So that means they're going to go 500 plus 40, 145 to well, go 80, 500. 80 is a little bit under. It's a little under, right. I would take that. I would, I would say like a seven. I'll take that. I know they're rebuilding, but I don't think going over 500 is a lot to ask for. I'm taking that bet. I'm taking I mean, they it. won. They won 74 games last year, so that's only six under that, you know. And they've added Dansby Swanson, yeah, they added Hosmer. They added Trey Mancini. You know, I, pitching might be a little bit of a question still, but I, that's what I, I just feel like with those additions. I, I think that they're 
at least a 500 team that should be, you know, in the mix for a wild card spot by the time it's all. Yeah. So I like it as well. Let's go. I'd I'd give it a solid. I I do. I'd push mine up to an eight or a nine. I think. Nice. My confidence. Jesse, Jesse actually pointed this out to me the other day. And the first thing I said, I was like, I think they're going to go 500. Yeah. And then he told me about the 74 wins. I'm like, yeah, I would feel pretty confident. In that. Love it. And then you get plus odds on that. I'd be really confident if I was. I'm going to be looking at my apps once I get done with the show. I'll just tell all you right. that. I don't know if it's changed at all since well, the season has started now. And they've already, they're, you know, one, one, one win closer. They only need 79 now. Only 79 more, baby. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. So NFL owners decided against a proposal that would have allowed Sunday games to be flexed to Thursday night on two weeks' notice this season. They were considering this. Jesse and I talked about it earlier Hmm. in the week. But owners did agree to modify the existing rule that will allow teams to play a maximum of two short-week Thursday games in a season instead of just one. So what that means is, you know, some teams could play two Thursday night games. Others might not have to play any games Mm -hmm. because – they're not going to necessarily flex them, but they might schedule. And in some cases, you know, like if you play a Thanksgiving game and then play on a Thursday the week after that, which the Cowboys have done quite a bit, that's not considered a short week game. So in that case, a team like Dallas or who, you know, whoever their opponent is on Thanksgiving or, you know, any of those other teams that are playing on Thanksgiving, they can end up with three Thursday games. Instead of just one or two. So do you buy or sell this change allowing more Thursday games for teams, even if they're not flexing right. like they were originally talking about? Here's why I'm gonna buy it. Okay. Normally the Thursday games are terrible. They're 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 unwatchable. They're games I don't care about. Okay. If you offer more opportunities for more teams to play them, maybe we'll get some better teams playing each other on Thursday nights. Or the flip side to that is maybe they're all just going to be terrible. Like, I mean, that's always a possibility too. Like maybe the Texans are going to get three Thursday night games and the name your crappy team. They all get the Thursday night games, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that could definitely happen. I was trying to look at it as a glass half full situation and that, you know, you're going to get more opportunities for other teams to get some Thursday night games because. Right now, the Thursday lineup is just awful. I mean, Al Michaels, who's paid to call the games, was calling the games awful. That's bad. Yeah, but he's taking that paycheck for calling yes, the games at he's the same time. All he's got, the way. He's not, he's not giving that money back, and we're talking millions. All the way to the bank. Back. And I agree with John. All games should be played on Sunday or Monday. I have no problem with that. And right. worth, you know, like, I just, it is, like, I, I never get too wrapped up in, like, what's fair and what's not fair. But when you're talking about the NFL and these guys are literally throwing themselves into car wrecks on every play out there and you're making them play on three days rest, not just once now, but in some cases twice. And then, you know, another Thursday game potentially on top of that. And then other guys are, you know, other teams are not going to have to play any Thursday games. I can't believe that, like, doesn't the players union have a say in any of this? I'm shocked that. (laughs) Seriously. Seriously. I'm shocked that they don't because it's just like from a competitive situation, it, it, it's it's totally unfair yeah. to to make teams play potentially twice on short on a short week, and then another team doesn't have to play any short week games on a Thursday night. It just makes no sense to me that yeah. they would allow this. So it's yeah. a complete complete sell for me. Oh, okay, I like it because like I've I I've always thought that like. The way they do it right now is dumb to begin with. Like, in a lot of cases, they give the bye the week after you play the Thursday game. I've always thought, give them the bye the week before the Thursday game. So you've almost got two weeks in between there. Like, just because it's like, I just just can't imagine, like, trying to, you know, because some of these guys... It it takes them the full week to get their body recouped and ready to play again on Sunday, especially as they start getting older. And now you're going to make them play two short week games like that on Thursday. I don't like it at all. That's tough. Yeah. 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 Play more Monday games. Do that. You know what? When they do the doubleheader at the beginning of the season on Monday, I friggin' love that. 
because usually the game that's first is the one I'm going to watch. Yeah. So, you know, I the games are so And it's like late, at 6 man. or 6.30. Yeah, yes. it's like beautiful. Like, give me that, give me that, <sighs> give me that early game. It's perfect. We're just, we're just old men, Vince. That's what it comes down to. You're not wrong. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for tonight. Appreciate you joining us. Hit that like button on your way out. We will have the Friday Rapid Fire at 5 o'clock tomorrow, and that'll be interesting because, excuse me, Jesse is going to be passing back from Chicago through South Bend, so I'll be in my usual room. Okay. And he'll probably be out in my living room <laughs> doing the show out there. So Love it. Yeah. So Hopefully the old internet can handle two uh, two signals. I know. I did, trust me. I've been thinking about that. <laughs> the fact that we had to to switch off the the internet earlier tonight right. makes me worry about that even more. So <laughs> I guess we'll see. Yeah. All right, Vince. I will talk to you tomorrow. We'll talk to everybody else tomorrow as well. Again, appreciate it on IB Nation Sports. Yeah, we will stick him in the bathroom, Derek. <laughs> IB Nation Sports stuff. Put him in the tub.